Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Neil Love from Research to Practice, and welcome to Oncology Today. This is going to be talking about the current management of prostate cancer as a follow-up to the recent GU Cancer Symposium in San Francisco. We have a little bit of a unique approach to this. We tried this uh, after the uh, GI Symposium. We thought we'd give it a shot here uh, after the GU Symposium. Uh, so I sat down with Dr. Dan Petrolak, who's one of the faculty here, and we did, uh, I did an interview with him for about an hour. We just published this as a podcast. If you go into the chat room and click on the link, you can actually hear or see uh, this interview. And as a follow-up to that, uh, we have uh, Dr. Andy Armstrong from the Duke Cancer Institute Center for Prostate and Urologic Cancers in Durham, North Carolina, and Dr. Rana McKay, from the University of California, San Diego, a co-leader of the GU Oncology Program there in La Jolla, California. And I'm actually going to play several uh, uh, excerpts from my interview uh, with Dr. Petrolak and see what Dr. Armstrong and Dr. McKay think about it, uh, trying to get into some of the same issues we got into in the original symposium in San Francisco and the same questions that we get from docs in practice about prostate cancer. Uh, some of the more challenging decisions, and particularly some of the things that are changing fairly rapidly. As always, if you have any questions or cases you'd like to run by the faculty, just type them into the chat room, and we'll talk about as many of these as we have time. We're putting out a quick uh, one-minute, uh, ten-item questionnaire in the beginning and end of the conference. If you take that, you'll get a lot more out of this, and we'll learn a little bit about you. We do uh, webinars all the time. Uh, we're going to be doing one next week uh, on uh, AML and MDS, our year in review series. A lot happening there as in all parts of oncology. On April the 12th, we'll be working with uh, Dr. Hurwitz and uh, finishing out our ER positive trickle negative uh, breast cancer series. Uh, we'll be coming back with a lung cancer year in review, review program talking about immunotherapy and other non-targeted approach. Nowadays, you can't even cover lung cancer in an hour anymore, and I think prostate cancer is going in the same direction. April 19th, we'll continue our Meet the our Year in Review uh, colorectal cancer program, and then we have quite a few nurses who actually uh, watch our webinars. We'll be doing our annual trek out to the ONS conference. Believe it or not, we're actually doing 10 symposium there, and then we're going from there to the AUA meeting, doing a couple there. Uh, so uh, if you're a nurse, uh, we're going to be putting these uh, online live, uh, or if you're actually in San Antonio for ONS, come on over and check it out. Uh, we know a lot of people end up listening to our work, and that's really part of the reason we did the format we're doing here today. If you like uh, podcasts, check out our Oncology Today pro uh, program, including a recent program on metastatic uh, bladder cancer. But today we're going to just chat. We have very few slides. We're going to make. We're just going to chat with our faculty and get their viewpoint of some of the more controversial things going on uh, in prostate cancer. Here's the original faculty that we had uh, for the uh, GU symposium. Uh, lots of questions that came out of there. We're going to try to answer as many of these as we can today. As uh, has been our case recently, our agenda is actually a playlist. We're not showing any actual slides, we're just showing video, and you can see we'll be uh, getting into a bunch of areas. But before we get started, uh, Andy, uh, you know, as mentioned, we're going to be heading out in about a month to the uh, AUA meeting. One of the urologists we're working for that was saying, hey, you know, the, I can't ever remember AUA having a drug study in the plenary session, but this year there's going to be one, because Dr. Neil Shore is presenting the Phase three Embark study on the use of enzalutamide in M0 disease. Uh, Andy, I know you and Ron, I don't have any sort of inside info for other than we know there's a press release here that says it's a positive study, not a huge surprise. Uh, any thoughts about uh, what we're going to see there, Andy, and how it's going to affect practice? To me, it seems like it has the uh, possibility of really having a big impact on a very common scenario. Yeah, Neil, this plays on the uh, the ever-evolving impact of the AR inhibitors moving earlier and earlier and showing a greater benefit as we target earlier disease. Enzalutamide, for example, started in the post-ocetaxel CRPC setting in the AFFIRM study and then showed a survival benefit in chemo-naive men prevail in non-metastatic CRPC 
in PROSPER in hormone sensitive metastatic disease in our ARCHES study and Enzymet. And then this would be the first phase three study in what we call non metastatic hormone sensitive, but very high risk. So these are men with PSAs above one, rapid doubling times less than nine months. So at risk for dying of prostate cancer someday. And they've all failed local therapy and had normal conventional imaging. And it's a complex three arm study, but it's basically ADT versus ADT plus ENZA with it. And it looks like the primary endpoint of metastasis free survival has been met. So we will just have to see how significant that is and, and then weigh that risk and benefit uh, for our patients as we make that decision in the clinic. And Rana, that's really a lead into the first general issue that I wanted to talk to the two of you about, which is what looks to me a, a, like an increasing use of intensification of endocrine therapy moving into earlier stage disease. And, you know, sometimes I feel a little weird making analogies to other cancers, but I know general oncologists are sitting there thinking. And one of the things we just did a program uh, in breast cancer on ovarian suppression and ablation. And one of the things about breast cancer is they rarely use ovarian suppression anymore by itself. You know, usually they're going to add tamoxifen or an AI almost all, you know, they rarely use it by itself. And it kind of, in a way, although of course now totally different hormone axis, it kind of seems like you all are moving in the same direction. You know, whether or not you use it in a lower risk patient, this comes up in breast cancer because it's more toxic. As the benefits decrease, you start thinking about it. But you sort of, they sort of accept the fact that generally speaking, you're going to get a better hazard rate if you add something to, in this case, uh, ovarian suppression. Do you think that principle in general exists for prostate cancer? That in general, if you intensify hormonal therapy, you may not want to do it because of the toxicity, but you will get more anti-tumor effect? Uh, yes, I do. I think it's all about risk stratification, though, in prostate cancer, because as Andy was saying, this study is designed in a high-risk patient population with biochemically recurrent disease with a rapidly rising PSA. And so, you know, I think it's, we're kind of constantly trying to carve out who are those high-risk people that are going to recur. I think what's so great about the Embark study is it's, it's in an area um, that biochemically recurrent space is a really unmet need. We have a parse, like a sparsity of like how best to treat um, patients in this disease context. I think, you know, the MF, the beauty now that we have MFS as an early surrogate endpoint is really, I think, a great thing for patients for potentially bringing drugs earlier into the clinical setting. Um, so, you know, I think this really is going to fill a gap. Um, you know, the Proteus trial, I think, to piggyback on intensification in the localized setting is looking at perioperative um, ADT with apalutamide perioperative to radical prostatectomy. So at every, at every fork in the road here, we're intensifying. But mainly in the high-risk population. There's a clinical trial being done um, through NRG uh, looking at uh, Decipher, uh, basically the Decipher score to intensify or de actually de-escalate therapy because if somebody is has lower-risk disease, they may not need as potent or as long of a duration of treatment. So uh, we'll get into what I want to get into. What I always love getting into is what you actually are doing today. You know, we can talk about the research and what's behind it and all, but and where it's going. But what people want to know is like, what are you doing right now? And, and right now, already in the chat room, they're bringing up the issue. Nicholas is saying, how do you apply the Embark study in the current setting of PSMA scan availability? Isn't the trial almost outdated? We'll get to that in a second, because actually uh, Dr. Petrolak sort of gets in that. Anyhow, let's uh, listen to this uh, first comment. I start out asking him generally how he thinks about managing uh, M0 recurrence in uh, prostate cancer and how he makes the decision about uh, whether or not to initiate uh, endocrine therapy, where I'm not sure you can t afterwards comment on whether we even have any randomized data to show that androgen deprivation, you know, what the effect of that is in this setting. But anyhow, here's Dr. Petrolak. It's always been the time frame from their local therapy to the time of their relapse. If it's fast, we know it's more aggressive. PSA doubling time is also something we use. If somebody has a doubling time of less than six months, clearly I'm going to go forth with ADT earlier than later. Six to nine months based upon their Gleason score, their ability to tolerate hormones. And if they're longer than the nine month period, I'm a little bit more, I guess, content to watch them for a period of time and see what their PSA velocity is. Now, of course, we have PSMA PET scanning. 
which helps us to identify potential areas that could be treated with radiation therapy for an oligometastatic lesion in addition to the ADT or potentially by itself. When you do treat these patients primarily, do you generally use intermittent androgen deprivation? I think it depends upon what's identified by imaging. Yes, if they're purely negative, I will do intermittent therapy. What about the choice of androgen deprivation? I generally like to use an antagonist to start because I don't have to prime the patient with an antiandrogen. It's just easy to treat a patient with Degarelex or Regulolex, get the testosterone down quickly, and then move forward. The recovery time to testosterone being elevated is more rapid in a patient who is treated with an antagonist. I was just thinking we could probably spend the whole hour just on this topic, but Andy, I I noticed that when I read the chat room comment, you kind of went like that, and he, again, Dr. Petrolak, so how do we incorporate, for for starters, PSMA (coughs) scanning in this scenario, and any other thoughts about uh, some of the things I asked him about intermittent therapy and choice of ADT? Right, Neil, if there's anything that's changed my practice and ability to visualize prostate cancer like never before, it's the PSMA PET imaging. Um, In this patient population of Embark, most of these men actually do have metastatic disease by PET imaging, very likely. Same in the non-metastatic CRPC, it's kind of the eye of the beholder. If you do the more sensitive imaging, you very commonly will see metastatic disease. So what we define as metastatic disease does depend on the imaging modality. Um, so um, right now, many patients, you know, including patients that I see regularly in clinic, they have a desire to avoid systemic therapy. And if they have a solitary metastatic site, there is data like from the Oriole study, the STOMP study, that in some selected men, you can delay safely that systemic therapy for a couple years. But these are small studies. They lacked really an adequate control. They didn't look at the combination of uh, AR inhibitor or ADT, which are life prolonging in men with conventional metastases. So I think it's a real big gray area where we need to know from future studies if metastasis directed therapy can layer on top and eventually allow us to stop these potent inhibitors long term. And, and that would be associated with much better quality of life for our patients. Raina, any thoughts? Raina, any thoughts? And also the issue of intermittent therapy. And can you use intermittent therapy plus an anti androgen intermittently? Yeah. Um, I, technically, you could. Um, I think the introduction of PSMA PET imaging has really created a lot of gray zones because what we're finding is these patients that have low volume oligometastatic disease that you're just, you know, are you going to treat them like an M1 conventional imaging and put them on continuous lifelong ADT and escalate them and do that? Or are you going to treat them like a biochemically recurrent patient and treat them with intermittent therapy? And I find that in my clinical practice, I'm merging the data sets. I'm merging the data from escalation in the hormone sensitive. I'm merging the data from intermittent. And then I'm giving a intermittent course of intensified therapy with SBRT. Now, whether that's the right strategy, we don't know, but it's a data-free zone because we now have had this tool that's been introduced in our clinic. So you ever heard of the art of oncology? That is oncology, (laughs) I guess. What about uh, the issue about uh, Andy's choice of androgen deprivation, particularly his thought about antagonists? Do you use much relagolix, for example? I like to use an antagonist uh, when I have a patient with symptomatic disease and I need a rapid reduction in testosterone where I'm worried that a flare, if the patient's not going to take an antiandrogen, uh, might compromise their symptoms, patients with spinal cord compression or bulky disease. In these non-metastatic patients, uh, a, a slight delay of a few weeks or a testosterone flare has really no clinical consequences. So I don't think it really matters whether you pick an agonist or antagonist. You do hear for men about rapid recovery, and I agree with Dr. Petrolak that rapid recovery, if you're going to do intermittent therapy, could be a good thing, but it might not always be a good thing because a rapid testosterone recovery might lead to a rapid PSA surge. Um, and so then your off period may not actually be as long. But I like the Relagolix for short courses, like four to six months. If that's all you're going to do, that's your total treatment, such as intermediate risk prostate cancer treated with radiation. That's kind of the sweet spot. 
So it's always tempting to try to go with the chat room. I could spend the whole hour just on the stuff that they're asking. But uh, before we go to the next uh, comment from Dan uh, Rana, uh, Merrill, I think you were mentioning something about this when we were chatting before we got started. Merrill says, uh, does germline mutational status affect the intensification methodology, Rana? Possibly. Uh, so, uh, you know, usually patients that have BRCA2 alterations, we know that those tumors can be more aggressive. They can have a shorter survival, shorter time to metastasis, more aggressive features. Um, there's some data to suggest that uh, BRCA1 and PALB2 may also behave in that manner. But some of the other germline alterations, we really don't know sort of how the, their clinical behavior is going to be. Um, I think that um, we actually recently had a publication on um, patients who have uh, hormone sensitive disease and have a BRCA alteration, what's their sort of time course, how, what happens to them in the metastatic hormone sensitive setting. And they do have a shorter time to develop, to developing MCRPC. And you could think about intensification strategies for those patients. But, you know, at the present time, we don't have data to intensify with a PARP inhibitor in the metastatic hormone sensitive setting. I, I do escalate with ADT and NHT, and then potentially docetaxel, but largely based on the clinical features we had discussed. So uh, Andy, we know about 30% of our audience in general has been in oncology less than five years. And if you've been in oncology less than five years, you don't, maybe don't realize that there weren't always a million phase three trials. It seemed like they all came out. And some of the ones that I thought were most striking when they first came out was the castrate resistant M0 studies. Uh, I was just amazed that they were that there were phase three trials, and all of a sudden there's a whole bunch of them. Any about any event, I asked him about the, that scenario as well as other earlier disease, and also I asked him about some of the new strategies in endocrine therapy. Here's what he had to say: the absolute PSA value and the PSA doubling time; those are the two factors that help to add an antiandrogen in that situation. Generally, I like darolutamide mainly because it has less CNS toxicity. There seems to be, in the studies, fewer falls in these patients. Often patients will have issues in terms of fatigue on nanzalutamide. Apalutamide is somewhat better, but rash can occur. And when the rash does come, it can be quite intense. I was curious, all of a sudden I see CDK coming up here, you know, trials of abemaciclib. What's the thinking in terms of CDK inhibitors and prostate cancer? Well, it's certainly analogous to what we're seeing in breast cancer, that you may actually be affecting the signaling that's going on within the cell, which may be important to overall resistance with the androgen receptors. So certainly I think it's a valid approach in this disease. What about Protax? Basically, the Protax bind to the androgen receptor, and there are specific mutations that it binds better to. The HH75Y mutation is one of them. There are activating mutations of the androgen receptor that will bind different ligands. And these Protax will actually degrade those particular variants of the androgen receptor, as well as the androgen receptor itself, wild type. So this is potentially a way of overcoming the resistance to primary androgen deprivation therapy. They're very effective in the laboratory one protac can take out as many as 700 copies of the androgen receptor. So the audience knows that translational biology is my weakness. You have to like really explain it. I want to see a simple diagram or just try to tell me how it works. So we'll get to some of these new things first. But first, to just, to, you know, sort of, again, as a follow-up to all these phase three studies, uh, looking at intensification of the anti-androgens, uh, Andy, uh, as he was alluding to, we have three options uh, and he has uh, come to the point of view that a lot of people have that darolutamide is the most uh, well-tolerated. Curious how you approach that decision of selection of antiandrogens, Andy. Yeah, I, I agree with Dan that, you know, the average age in this setting is somewhere in the high 60s, low 70s. Many of these patients have heart disease or comorbidities. They're taking many different agents that may have drug interactions. When we look at across the phase three studies, that's, you know, Aramis, Spartan, Prosper, you see equal efficacy, really better improvements in survival uh, in this setting. So they're all winners. There's no losers. But then 
all things being equal, you have to look at the differences in side effects and availability and costs. So as you're weighing kind of the pros and cons of each treatment, I agree with Dan that the goal here in these older men is to maintain quality of life, not to make it worse, um, not to burden them with severe financial toxicity, but also to delay metastasis and ultimately improve survival. I think darolutamide is a very good choice. Um, of course, you know, the, the ultimate choice is what's right for that individual patient. Each of these can be valuable. Uh, sometimes the costs out of pocket may differ. And so uh, hearing that, you know, it's important to realize that there are good choices out there. But I agree, the Achilles heel for apalutamide is the rash and the Achilles heel for enzalutamide or falls and fracture and sometimes cognitive effects. But that only occurs in a small percent of patients. Most patients can tolerate all of these three drugs very well for often many years, which is the data uh, around delaying metastasis. So you have to be prepared that these men are gonna be on these drugs for years. So I wanna get your thoughts also on the intent, the trials that are coming out, uh, looking at uh, endocrine intensification as we go to lower stage disease. Before we do though, Rana, I'm just gonna sort of sneak into the endocrine uh, sensitive metastatic setting that we're gonna to get to in a second. But one of the issues that I hear oncologists all the time is, okay, well, if you just said you think that darolunamide is better tolerated, is that well, we, if we're going to use just an antiandrogen and not, you know, chemotherapy, shouldn't we be using darolunamide alone? And then the investigators will go, well, we don't have any data. It's not approved. We're waiting for the data. So are you using something else, a choice of antiandrogen, Rana, or are you, are you actually able to get darolutamide, you know, outside the indication? Um, so I think it's variable. I think um, it's really tailored around the, the, the patient, what they can tolerate, um, what their copays are. I think if it was not to say up to me, I think from like the, the just – uh, thinking about resistance, um, I like to try to give Abby first if I can, um, you know, even though the data are, uh, you know, they're not level one evidence data, but there is data suggest from Kim Chi's groups and others that potentially there is a benefit to an ARSI in select patient populations after Abby, but the reverse isn't necessarily true. And whether that translates into overall survival, we don't have any data around that. So in my clinical practice, unless somebody has a contraindication, I actually try to get them generic abiraterone, um, which is pretty cost, you know, neutral and, um, you know, uh, but I think in the, in the setting where cost is not necessarily an issue and I'm worried about pill burden and I'm worried about cardiovascular tox or the hypertension or swelling or any of those other factors that I do reach for an ARSI. And I do like darolutamide. I think it's probably a best in class agent and um, I have been able to get it, um, you know, kind of without chemotherapy for some of my patients. I think the data without chemo is gonna be coming pretty soon um, from the Aeronote trial, which is largely an XUS study, which is looking at darolutamide versus um, just, or darolutamide ADT versus ADT alone. And then also the ARIS uh, sex study, which is a US study um, with the historic charted control, which is looking at the combination. So data will be available, I think, soon. So Andy, what I want to really know about and what I don't think most, a lot of people are as aware of, because I just am starting to, you know, kind of coming into my consciousness is the emerging data going earlier. So locally advanced uh, and also post prostatectomy uh, radi uh, salvage radiation therapy as example of two earlier scenarios. Are we there? Are you, are you intensifying endocrine therapy locally advanced right now, Andy? Absolutely. There's a couple reasons to go early. One is that resistance mechanisms are not there yet, such as AR amplification, AR splice variants, alterations in tumor suppressors like RB loss. These things emerge later and create AR therapy resistance. So when you hit the cancer early, when the AR is more non-mutated, you get more bang for your buck, so better survival. The second reason is that AR inhibition um, blocks DNA repair and that can synergize with radiation. We've been doing this for many years where we give ADT with radiation and see better cure rates and high-risk disease. And in the STAMPEDE study, a phase three randomized double-blind placebo-controlled study, abiraterone for two years with radiation improved survival and improved the cure rates of men with very high risk but localized prostate cancer. And so 
we have data coming from Atlas and Enzarad and Dazzle High Cap. These are non-metastatic but high-risk trials. And like Rana mentioned, we have some genomic stratified studies coming through the Quapper Group system, like the Predict RT study, using that genomic decipher assay to say, you know, who should get more intensive therapy, who could survive just as well without the intensified therapy. So yeah, it's here. It's part of the NCCN algorithm now, and it's part of practice now with abiraterone, but more are coming. So, Arana, any thoughts on that? Also, the post-prostatectomy salvage or radiation, and any thoughts about uh, by intensifying hormonal therapy, maybe decreasing the duration, you know, getting away from two years, which is not very easy to get through. Uh, any thoughts about these scenarios, where we are today, uh, particularly, again, post-prostatectomy uh, uh, recurrence? Yeah, very good question. Actually, there was uh, a study that was presented at GU ASCO just, a couple, just about a month ago called the Formula 509 study, which looked at apalutamide plus ADT, um, uh, you know, uh, an abiraterone plus apalutamide plus ADT in the biochemically recurrent setting. And that study only had six months of hormonal therapy. And um, if you remember from ESMO last year, they presented the Radicals HD trial, which looked at showing a benefit of the two years of uh, ADT for that high-risk population group. And so, you know, we don't have the data yet, but kind of raising the question of, can you get, get by with a shorter course of intensified therapy versus a longer course of non-intensification. I think we, those are really important questions in the field. There's a study called Indicate being run through the cooperative groups, and it's a study that's using PSMA imaging for stratification around radiation therapy in the post-operative setting for people with biochemically recurrent disease, but that study is actually modulating the systemic therapy based off of whether disease is present or not. So uh, we're going to maybe move now. Uh, now we're warmed up, and now we get into, the, to me, the main event. So hormone-sensitive metastatic disease. I've been, you know, I listen to you all and think about what you're saying, and uh, I guess so. I guess the question I want to ask is, to the two of you, is are we overutilizing docetaxel and triplets in this situation? I'll show you in general how Dan thinks through hormone-sensitive metastatic disease, what he says is something that we've all heard from many investigators. I, I think probably echoes uh, your approach too. But I think about you know the man, who, particularly who's never had prostate cancer, but even if they did, you know all of a sudden they've got metastatic disease. And what a you know what a, a human issue to deal with that. They're going to be dealing with ADT maybe for the first time, or they would be for the first time. Another life altering. Then on top of that, they're going to get chemotherapy. Uh, and I guess, you know, my question is, uh, you know, did they really need it or could they do just as well uh, by delaying it? I'm going to let you listen uh, to what Dan has to say, but I just want to put out the thought. I was mentioning this to you when we, we could start it, but I just want to mention it to the audience as well. To me, I want to know how comparable it is to the situation that all oncologists are familiar with in terms of first-line therapy of metastatic non-small cell lung cancer in a patient who has a high PD-1. And we know that using an IO alone has a very good effect in those patients. However, and in general, that's the way they get treated unless they have a lot of disease and are particularly symptomatic and really, quote, like can't afford to progress. And then they will add chemotherapy because you see a little blip earlier on if you add the chemotherapy. So, they, but they don't necessarily do it in everybody who can tolerate it. If they have a young patient who's otherwise well, they don't have critical disease, they'll try a PD-1. If that doesn't work, okay, then they can give them chemo. And I don't think that's what's going on in prostate cancer, and I just want to know why. That's all. I just want to know, because like, as far as I know, there's no trial that shows that adding docetaxel to uh, uh, intensified hormonal therapy as a triplet is better than giving it later on sequentially. Uh, but you can you, know, you can give me your thoughts on this. Here's Dan's thoughts. And that's generally thought now that the de novo metastatic disease is the more aggressive form of prostate cancer. But I think that age has something to do with it. Number of sites of metastases, visceral metastases, well, particularly liver, those are what I would say are high-risk poor prognosis features, more than four lesions on bone scan. 
those situations, we will go forth with an arisense like regimen, you know, giving darolutamide plus chemotherapy or giving the PEACE-1 type regimen, which is abiraterone plus docetaxel. In a patient who may be frailer, whose lifespan may not be as long, who may not have as aggressive disease, we will go according to stampede-like regimen where we would radiate the primary and give abiraterone plus standard ADT. What we really need is a three-arm randomized trial of just an antiandrogen versus docetaxel plus that antiandrogen versus docetaxel and probably will never get done. So, and, you know, Andy, I see this editorial you did. There's like this 25-page paper meta-analysis of uh, all the trials, except none of those trials, you know, looked at adding docetaxel and types of, and you know, I don't know exactly how they could do that. But let me start with Rana first. So is Dan echoing, you know, the way you think this through? And do you think that we're overutilizing docetaxel? I definitely don't think we're overutilizing docetaxel. I think when you look at the data of utilization of docetaxel across the board, even in the MCRPC setting where it's demonstrated life prolonged effect for over a decade, the utilization is at less than 10% or 10% if we're lucky. So I don't think we're overutilizing it. Um, I think we need to understand patient selection better. I think we need to understand who's gonna derive the most benefit from, from docetaxel, potentially derive less benefit from like AR based therapies or, you know, and try to uh, escalate those people that need it and spare the people that don't need it. So just out of curiosity, if we could, or if we had done a randomized study where docetaxel uh, was, you know, intensified hormone plus or minus docetaxel, you know, I certainly can see maybe in the short run, you would see, you know, better efficacy, but do you think in the long run, survival, et cetera, is affected, Rana? Um, we, we don't know the answer, um, but my hope is that those patients that I think Andy and I had mentioned have worse clinical outcomes, those patients with liver metastases, those patients that have bad genetics in their tumor, we know they prognostically do worse. And can you mitigate that with adding docetaxel? So Andy, any thoughts? I like to be a troublemaker. You know, I always get on the myeloma people about transplant after the termination study, but I, you know, I can't get them to budge. Any thoughts about this, Andy? Yeah, the only thing I might add is maybe the use of the transitive property. So in the Stampede trial, they had a arm at Abby over ADT and it won. And then they had an arm where they got docetaxel and it beat ADT. And when they compared those two arms against each other, where particularly the patients contemporaneously enrolled, there was no difference between Abby and docetaxel for survival, suggesting that uh, you know they're equivalent. So then when you see PEACE-1 and, and Aresens show best survival over the doublet, that makes me convinced that triplet is better than double for some patients. It's definitely not for all patients, not like the low volume patients, the metachronous patients, uh, but for these very poor prognosis patients that it will be enriched in these genetic alterations, like Rana mentioned, P53, BRCA, uh, RB loss. They're enriched in liver metastases. They have a high burden of symptomatic disease. That's where they need all hands on deck and they might need a fourth drug. That's where other uh, phase three studies like PSMA addition, the PARP inhibitors, are really trying to to look at alternatives to dose taxol or to join dose taxol. So uh, before we go into the next scenario, I forgot to ask you too about uh, the new approaches that we I was talking with with Dan and uh, Rana. You seem to be a very good uh, biologic explainer. Maybe you can explain how CDK inhibitors are thought to maybe be helpful in prostate cancer. Sure thing, no problem. So CDK4 inhibitors or CDK4-6, the cyclin kinase, dependent kinases, they affect the cell cycle. They affect basically the process of dividing a cell and mitosis and are a part of cell proliferation. And if you think of, this is kind of back to biology, but a cell is either resting, it's in G0, and then when it enters its growth phase, it goes into G1, then it replicates its DNA, goes into the S phase, then it goes into G2, and then it goes into mitosis and divides and makes two cells. Well, the transition from G1 to S is very, very highly regulated. It's a highly regulated kind 
kind of checkpoint within that cell cycle. Um, and the cyclin-dependent kinases regulate that process. And these inhibitors like abemacyclib, palbocyclib, ribocyclib, they impede the activity of these of cyclin, um, you know, CDK4 and 6, and prevent that transition from G1 to S. And so that's how they're effective. These drugs are already FDA approved for utilization in uh, advanced um, breast cancer. And even abemacyclib is approved in the localized setting for people with early hormone sensitive breast cancer. And there does seem to be some synergy in um, and crosstalk between the angiogen and receptor pathway and also the cell cycle pathway. And so now these drugs are being heavily tested um, in um, uh, advanced prostate cancer, abemacyclib is being tested in the refractory setting in Cyclone 1. Uh, Cyclone 2 is testing abemacyclib in frontline MCRPC, and Cyclone 3 is testing abemacyclib in the metastatic hormone sensitive debt setting. There, there's more large phase 3s happening with abemacyclib than there is data of its activity in, in um, prostate cancer. You know, that helped me. And uh, audiences, in case you don't know, there's a press release. There's been all this debate about this Abema adjuvant study that you mentioned. And guess what? Now there's a, a new study coming out with RIBO that, you know, very similar findings they saw in the adjuvant settings. And now we're going to have the choice of two CDKs. What about Protax? Can you give us a little kind of simple approach to what they are and what you think that maybe the future holds for it? Rana? So Protax basically are um, targeting the angiogen receptor for degradation in the proteasome. And if you think of the proteasome and its function in the cell, it's basically the garbage disposal of the cell, all the sort of things that you just want kind of out of the cell um, and degraded, they cannot get ubiquitinated and flagged to be degraded in the cell. And so what these Protax are is they take the androgen receptor, you know, we don't, you know, the androgen receptor, we know its role in advanced disease, and they basically target it so it goes in the garbage disposal, and we get rid of it completely. And so um, that's the way these Protax works. There's a estrogen degrader now that's, um, uh, you know, being used in, in breast cancer, and now this is kind of a similar type of concept in prostate cancer. Yeah, and finally in breast cancer, we're getting oral. They have the oral surds finally after like 20 years of using IM fulvestrant. We're going to talk now a little bit about uh, castrate-resistant metastatic disease. Also curious, or any inside info on what's going on with lutetium and whether or not we're going to be able to access it. But uh, here are some of Dan's thoughts about how he thinks through uh, upfront therapy. We're going to get to PARP in a second, so we're just putting that aside and having his thoughts about approaching these patients. Certainly, I don't usually administer another next generation antiandrogen after the first one. The question is, can you re-induce a patient with docetaxel at that point? I actually prefer giving cabazitaxel because of the toxicity issues. I think it's a less toxic drug. Of course, the second is to check their next generation sequencing. If they have a DNA repair mutation, a PARP inhibitor would be appropriate. Additionally, in an asymptomatic patient with non-visceral disease, cipulucilty does also come into play as well. We don't see PSA responses, but we do see an improvement in survival with that preparation. The other thing I think it's important to recognize is that we do see degeneration to the neuroendocrine component of prostate cancer in these patients. And that's something that has to be treated a little bit differently with a platinum-based compound. What about the issue of lutetium? What do you use first, lutetium or radium? So if a patient is strongly PSMA PET positive, that would help me move towards lutetium PSMA as my first treatment. Of course, we know with radium-223 that patients with bulky nodal disease are not appropriate. Patients with visceral disease are not appropriate. So Andy, any thoughts about uh, this scenario? Also, you know, in the past you did work on predictors of benefit. That you mentioned that he doesn't use uh, secondary hormonal therapy, A or VN7, but is that sort of out the door or still a possibility using a, a second uh, uh, anti-androgen or intensified therapy? No, I, I agree with him that most patients fail to respond to a second AR inhibitor. There are some 
predictive biomarkers, prognostic biomarkers, that if you have a patient that's appropriate for a choice between a taxane and an AR inhibitor, like the ARV7 circulating tumor cell assay, you can identify those men that are definitely not going to respond to an AR inhibitor. Uh, that's not commonly used in practice because you know, of that cross resistance issue, even when the ARV test is negative. And we have a long menu, like Dan mentioned, of radium and PSA lutetium, cabazitaxel, PARP inhibitors, pembrolizumab to offer patients. So I do like the idea of personalized testing, molecular profiling. I like the idea of a PSMA PET scan. And like the vision study uh, suggested, those men with a, a more bright SUV, broad uptake are going to survive longer with PSMA lutetium. Those with dim disease, negative disease, probably would be best triaged towards cabazitaxel or radium or a clinical trial. I also echo his concerns about the neuroendocrine transformed disease. Small cell prostate cancer is really difficult to treat. It really requires a separate research paradigm. Um, we're developing novel radiotherapies for these tumors. Uh, PSMA is absent in these tumors frequently, uh, developing platinum doublets and building on that with immunotherapies is kind of a work in progress. Um, these patients really deserve referrals to academic centers for clinical trials. And uh, I know there's been some work done. I think uh, actually one of you was on one of these involved with that, looking at whether liquid biopsies can give you clues or hints that the patients had a uh, small cell. Uh, what do you look for? I, I've been asking people about that, and I didn't even know it had been looked at. What actually do you see in the liquid biopsy, Andy? Well, small cell disease is characterized by RB loss, P10 loss, P53 loss. These three tumor suppressors, two of those three is associated with aggressive features like small cell. And you can find that with liquid, you can find that with solid. It's actually harder with the liquid biopsy to find copy losses. So um, much more reliable with a, a solid biopsy, a metastatic biopsy. So if you're worried about small cell transformation, such as a visceral pattern that's changed or that dyssynchrony between PSA and tumor bulk, get a new biopsy and that will help you. And then you can send so, that for next-gen sequencing. So, uh, Rana, I don't think I heard him uh, mention CIPT. Is that, like, off the table completely? Do you still use that? Um, I do use it in very select patients who I would otherwise do nothing. So I think the sweet spot for um, Cipulusal T is maybe somebody who has a rising PSA right off of their hormone sensitive course, you know, they don't have radiographic progression, but, you know, they're just starting to develop a rising PSA and, and early CRPC, and you're kind of dragging your feet regarding taking them off of their uh, ARSI. Um, and so maybe we get a course of Cipulusal T in, do it for three weeks or, you know, six weeks, whatever, and then kind of move on to the next thing. One thing I would point out, so, I'm sorry, I didn't mention uh, CIPT, is, is that there are subgroups who benefit more, and it is a life-prolonging therapy. Those men with lower PSAs and disease burden, African-American patients we've shown from the PROCEED study seem to have an even greater survival benefit as compared to men of European ancestry. So um, it is a life-prolonging therapy, and it should be discussed in appropriate asymptomatic patients with MCRPC. I think I've seen trials looking at IOs plus CIPT. I don't know if they're already gone and not, if, but any thoughts about that strategy, Andy? Does that make sense to you? Uh, it makes sense, but people have to show actual data that there's a benefit or synergy. The IOs have gotten really a bad name in prostate cancer recently for negative Merck studies. I'm not sure what that costs, but not a small amount. But uh, pembrolizumab has generally failed to improve survival when partnered with Enza, when partnered with Elaparib, when partnered with docetaxel or by itself. So uh, it is active in MSI high disease, maybe active in CDK12 alterations, but not in unselected patients. So, uh, Rhino, we uh, did a symposium on Monday on endometrial cancer at the SGO meeting. And, of course, we had a, a couple of cases of people with fantastic uh, responses to IOs who had MSI high disease. Of course, that's pretty common in endometrial cancers. Have you had any patients uh, in your own practice who had uh, MSI great responses uh, like we see in other tumors for a long period of time? Yeah. 
Oh, yeah. Yeah, we've definitely seen them. And I think that's why we have to test um, individuals for these mutations. I think it's critically important to do the testing. They're not very common. They're present in about 1% to 2% of individuals who have advanced disease. But I always test everybody, and I test them early so that I can kind of begin to lay out sort of the landscape for them as they're going to kind of go through their journey. So I think it's critically important to, to test. So I want to talk about PARP inhibitors in a second, but just one more question, again, to lutetium, Andy. Any comments on the hold on lutetium? Uh, any information on how long it's going to be, what the reason is? And in general, if you have access to it, where are you bringing lutetium in? I know you mentioned it kind of depends a little on the way the scan looks, but where are you thinking about it right now? So yeah, lutetium was the only FDA approved therapy in 2022. It's probably one of the number one reasons for getting consults at my center right now. And, um, you know, we just treated, I think, our 110th patients. And so we are actively treating many patients, but it is not an easy drug. It has to be imported with a nuclear import license from outside of the U.S., uh, Novartis is building manufacturing warehouses, but those require FDA oversight and approval. And there is a supply chain issue. You know, if there's impurities, if there's a contamination issue, they can't dose that. There's very strict safety and oversight of that product. And that's for the good of our patients. And it is disappointing when you go for several months without being able to start new patients. And I think all of our patients feel that frustration. We hope that this will end as the manufacturing capabilities in our own country kind of ramp up. And especially as you see like the PSMA4 study being positive, we haven't seen how positive, but suggesting that uh, radioligand therapy may be beneficial even before chemotherapy. There's a a big desire of our patients to delay dose the taxol or cabazzi taxol. Um, with the radioligand therapy because of the more favorable quality of life and improved survival. But that, that data will be forthcoming at an upcoming meeting. So uh, why don't we talk a little bit about PARP inhibitors? And again, I asked uh, Dan, uh, first of all, how he thinks through the initial evaluation, uh, what kind of evaluation, and then we'll get into a little bit in terms of what that means in terms of patient care. Here's Dr. Petrolak. We had two FDA approved agents, Olaparib, which is approved in patients who've received a prior next generation antiandrogen, and then Rucaparib, which is approved in those patients who've received docetaxel, as well as a next generation antiandrogen. So some very, very interesting data was presented from the Triton 3 trial. Patients were randomized with DNA repair mutations to receive Rucaparib or dealer's choice. That is helping us to move rucaparib up in the treatment algorithm for castration-resistant disease. You don't need to give docetaxel. So we also have data from the TALPRO2 study where castration-resistant prostate cancer patients who had, in general, not received a prior antiandrogen therapy were randomized to either talazoprib plus a next-generation antiandrogen or the next-generation antiandrogen alone. So the difference here is that in the HRD negative patients, you did see an improvement in RPFS as well as in the positive patients. That was not seen with niraparib, and it was seen with an RPFS endpoint with olaparib. However, the survival data from olaparib was presented at this meeting, and there was really no major difference in overall survival in the HRD negative patients. So, uh, Rana, the last two uh, GE symposium have been PARP City. You know, last year, two major phase three trials, and now this year, two more major phase three trials for docs out there taking care of CLL, myeloma, and lung cancer, and it's hard to kind of keep up. Can you kind of sort of distill out what we've learned over these two kind of different points in the disease also? Right. Can you kind of put a little bit in perspective what we've learned these past uh, two meetings? Absolutely. So I think for one, um, for patients who have, um, you know, BRCA1-2 alterations, and, you know, I think for, for probably our purposes, we can kind of have the grab bag of the HRR alteration, patients with HRR alterations like what was used in Profound, those patients um, particularly derive benefit with regards to utilization with a PARP inhibitor. Um, the data for Rucaparib is really around BRCA1, BRCA2. The data for um, Olaparib is really around 
you know, the cohort of HRR with a focus on BRCA1-2 ATM, those people derive benefit with a PARP inhibitor as monotherapy um, in the post-NHT setting. Now, there's been three trials that have, and so that Triton-3 study was basically the, the, the uh, confirmatory trial for Triton-2, which was, had led to the FDA approval for Rucaparib. So Triton-3 was sort of the um, final, uh, not say final approval, but the confirmatory study. Um, but there was three studies that looked at the role of PARP inhibitors with an ARSI in the first line um, MCRPC setting in people that have never been escalated in the metastatic hormone sensitive setting. I think maybe about 10% of individuals got docetaxel in the MHSPC setting, but this, these were people who did not see um, an NHT or ARSI in that setting. And my hope is that this population is just ever dwindling because we are going to be appropriately escalating most patients with metastatic hormone sensitive disease. But I think there's been a lot of controversy about the results of these three studies, you know, Propel, Magnitude, and Talipro2. And it's largely around our um, lack of understanding of what's going on in the biomarker negative group. I think all of the data are consistent in that patients who have HRR alterations and what's driving most of the responses and the efficacy is really the BRCA2, that the data are, are strong and compelling that if somebody had not been escalated, they have a HRR alteration, um, that giving them a PARP inhibitor combined with an ARSI and each of these studies used you know, whether it was abiraterone or anzalutamide, the, the, the PARP inhibitor is all different. I think mechanistically, giving the combination seems to make sense. I think there's a lot of controversy about whether to um, combine with a PARP inhibitor for the biomarker negative group. We have one negative trial, two positive tri trials, a lack of an overall survival signal, mainly because the trials were not powered to really evaluate overall survival. They were just looking for kind of trends in overall survival. We have an approval of the combination in unselected patients in the uh, EU. I think the you know the bait has remained um, you know here on the table. I think things are kind of uh, being reviewed at the FDA level, but I think there's a lot of controversy about what to do for biomarker negative. So I could say join the club because this is this uh, discussion has been going on in ovarian cancer for the last couple of years. And uh, Andy, we work with your colleague Angela Secord, you know, trying to figure out again that same. Interestingly, in uh, ovary, it's neraparib that the trial had showed a benefit with the HR proficient, not elaparib. And then you guys come in and it's the exact opposite. Uh, but I'm just kind of curious, Andy, what your take on on this is. Um, do you think there's synergy between, you know, endocrine therapy and uh, PARP such that maybe you get greater benefit if you give the two together? Any toxicity issues in giving the, the two together? And also what your experience is with toxicity in general, Andy, with PARP inhibitors in men with prostate cancer? Right. So that's a lot to unpack there. But uh, in general, I think there is some synergy. Um, particularly in BRCA, but then less so in non-BRCA, but yes, potentially some synergy. When we talk about biomarker negative, the way I like to call this is, is HRD not detected, all right? So you have patients out there that when you do a cell-free assay, you don't find the BRCA2 mutation. It doesn't mean it's not there. Um, as I mentioned, these cell-free DNA assays can often fail to find uh, a mutation, especially a copy loss when it's mixed in with a sea of wild type normal DNA. The same with tumor biopsies. There's tumor heterogeneity, there's evolution of that cancer. Uh, a second point is that there are many other potentially synergistic mutations besides BRCA that might create PARP sensitivity. And there's an emerging literature in the translational field about what other mutations that are not captured in this traditional HRD assay. So I think there's going to be some emerging data in this HRD undetected group that will suggest that there's a subset of patients that are getting greater benefit. I don't think the PARP AR strategies for all patients. I think it will be nice to have a choice um, in patients that haven't had that escalation up front where you can have that risk benefit discussion around the value of delaying progression free survival, the added toxicities. I think all the PARP inhibitors do have differences in toxicity. You saw with Talapro 2, Talazoprib's got like a 40, 50% transfusion rate. With the Laparib, it was 15 to 20%. With Neraparib, it was much higher as well, more marrow suppression. So 
there may be issues with being able to be dose intense with these PARP inhibitors across trials. So they're, they can't really all be compared to uh, just as a class. So I'm almost hesitant to bring this case up from the chat room, but let's give it a quick shot. Uh, Rana, this is from Nabin. High volume uh, metastatic uh, castrate sensitive prostate cancer. It's uh, ADT plus Abby docetaxel. Germline BRCA2, good response to trip. This kind of gets into, theoretically, where's the best place to bring in a PARP inhibitor, because this is now castrate-sensitive metastatic disease. Good response to triple therapy. Should maintenance be ABI or ABI plus Olaparib? So maintenance right now should be ABI. Um, we don't really have data for what to how to escalate um, with a PARP inhibitor in the hormone sensitive setting. There will be trials that will be looking at that, but we don't, we don't have that data. I would feel perfectly comfortable with, with this person, like once they develop frontline CRPC, actually transitioning them right into a PARP inhibitor, but I wouldn't layer it on with the abiraterone. And of course, now we have, you know, PARP, uh, Olaparib in the adjuvant setting in breast cancer, uh, you know, a lot of issues there. Let's uh, listen to Dan. Uh, I'm curious, I asked him where he thinks that theoretically, uh, you know, putting aside what you can do, but theoretically the best place to uh, integrate a PARP inhibitor in a patient, for example, I said, suppose the patient has BRCA2 germline, where should it be? Also ask him a little bit about side effects. Here's Dr. Petrolak. So that's a really interesting question. I like giving it right at first progression after hormone therapy. It's a targeted agent. We have good evidence, and particularly in the BRCA2s, that these drugs work. I'm curious whether you have any patients who, you know, had great benefit from a PARP inhibitor. Yes. One of our patients who had metastatic disease to the liver be on a PARP inhibitor for about two and a half years with a good response and do very, very well with it. The BRCA2 patients are the ones who do the best and will get the longest responses out of it. And you view somatic mutations, somatic BRCA, for example, essentially the same from a therapeutic point of view as germline BRCA? Yes. And you talked about other alterations, ATM, but what about PAL-B2? PAL-B2 does very well. The numbers are very small. It's not as frequent as the other mutations, but it does very well. The other thing you referred to was the tolerability issues with PARP inhibitors and ovarian cancer, now breast cancer. The two big issues there have been uh, cytopenias and GI upset. What do you see in prostate cancer? So the cytopenias, I think, are the more prevalent in my experience, particularly anemia. Transfusions are required in some patients, but generally it's very, very well tolerated. The nausea can be a problem, but not as significant, I think, as the anemia. So, you know, people say, well, anecdotal medicine, if you ask for one case, but, you know, it's, some, you know, it's interesting. And when I said, you ever see long-term responses, you considered two and a half years a good long-term response, which it is, but it's also not five years. Rana, uh, like maybe what you would see with MSI high and an IO uh, in some situations. Rana, any thoughts about, uh, again, uh, the use of PARP inhibitors, uh, whether you've seen uh, prolonged responses uh, to single-agent PARP inhibitors? And what the spectrum is of alterations that will get you, theoretically, I mean, not putting aside reimbursement, where you think they have the most benefit. In ovary, they have these LOH scores. Uh, if, that, if it's done, would you buy into that as an indication, if you could? Yeah, no, very good question. I think um, the one thing I will say is I don't think we're curing people or, you know, it's not like the IO therapy of uh, – uh, you know, that these are targeted therapy strategies. So I, I don't think we're going to be seeing sort of that tail on the curve with these PARP inhibitors. I think they, they function, um, you know, in a targeted therapy type of strategy, but there's differential outcomes based off of the type of mutations that people have. The, the, the BRCA2, BRCA1 tend to respond really great. PALB2 tends to respond real great. ATM doesn't respond well. Um, you know, uh, 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 CDK12 does not respond very well. Check to, eh. so I think um, there's just not a lot of these alterations. I would say also to kind of piggyback on what Dan was kind of commenting on, we don't really know whether the somatic or the germ lines have differential outcomes like we see in ovarian cancer. In ovarian cancer, the patients with germline alterations tend to actually do 
really well with long-term PARP inhibitor use. And, you know, I don't know that we have good data in the prostate world kind of comparing somatic versus um, BRCA or uh, germline uh, BRCA alteration status. There are studies that are actually looking at early testing with a PARP inhibitor. Um, there's a study called Neptune looking at the early utilization of PARP inhibitor prior to radical prostatectomy in people with germline or somatic BRCA1-2 alterations in a potential way to kind of induce pathologic response and potentially cure more patients, but the data is still early. So a final comment uh, from you, Andy. I'm not going to actually play this video, but I can tell you that I was asking him about uh, whether or not immunotherapy, you know, prostate cancer seems to be the one place where checkpoint inhibitors haven't penetrated other than uh, the MSI. Uh, I asked him about the idea, which is, as you all know, very successful, for example, in renal cancer, TKIs plus immunotherapy. I've seen the trials, for example, CABO and NEVO. And also, we're starting to see bispecific antibodies, I guess CAR-T. Any thoughts about some of these new strategies and where they might be heading, Andy? Sure. I think when your goal is cure of metastatic disease, like in other solid tumors, immunotherapy is where I would put most of my investment and advice for clinical trials. And we know that prostate cancer, much like hormone receptor positive breast cancer, is immune evasive, often an immune desert, doesn't respond to traditional PD-1 blockade, but you still see uh, myeloid suppressor cells. You see other important T cell checkpoints and myeloid checkpoints. And I think we're just at the beginning of understanding how to engage those checkpoints, block those, overcome that immune evasion. Um, CAR T cells against PSMA and other antigens specific to prostate or neuroendocrine cancer will be important. Bispecifics, tri-specifics, NK cell engagers, um, radio immunotherapies. It's, it's a really a wide open field right now. Um, the issues are lineage plasticity, antigen downregulation, that adaptive tumor evasion that the cancer is exerting on the immune system. So it's probably going to take combinations, but uh, um, I'm very encouraged by the promise I'm seeing. So, Rana and Andy, thank you so much uh, for joining us today. I mean, it wasn't that long ago that it was hard to fill an hour with prostate cancer. I feel like today was like a tasting menu. Almost every topic we talked about, really, was just a little bit of what we could talk about. So much going on. Really exciting to be in oncology today. And speaking of that, audience, uh, check out our year in review program next week on AML and MDS. I'm really curious uh, what the faculty is going to say about uh you know, what's come into AML, which of course is venetoclax HMA combinations now moving down into MDS and even the lines between the two seem to be getting blurred. So we'll see what Dr. Baradi and Dr. We have to say about that. Be safe, stay well, and have a great night. Thanks a lot, Rana. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. Thank you, Neil.